Hello, I am Leave Nelson B, musician for Lonely Ghost Records, and this is Talent with Alan. Here, we will go over recent Lonely Ghost releases, as well as those from affiliated artists in a quest to get liner notes that you cannot get in a digital era. I hope you enjoy. Uh, the JPEG Mafia. Oh no, I haven't listened yet. Yeah, it is. It is pretty damn good. <laughs> I'll have to check it out. It's on my list. I have like so many albums I haven't listened to yet that I should. This, this was a. This was wait. I, I, I guess I shouldn't say it was a good new release week. There's a uh, two other records came out that I listened to the fucking Wale record and uh, who else? Who the fuck else I did I listen to this morning? Yeah, while they while they can't carry a record by himself. I don't know if you remember Ace Hood way back in the day. Yeah, yeah. But Ace Hood was like in like D Block, but like every Ace Hood album have had like a million features. Yeah. And the last one, really I, you know, I I only listened to him in like passing because I always thought he sucked. But well, he was affiliated with like the Locks, which were great, yeah. you know. So that's why I gave Ace Hood a chance, but. Like it's, but the last Wally record had a whole ton of features on it, which is the reason why I don't like it. But the reason why he does have a whole ton of features on it because he can't carry an album by himself. I actually don't think Wally. <laughs> he's had a couple of good songs. He almost had like that moment back in probably like what 2012. I think yeah, no, I think Attention Deficit was good. Uh, I, th- I really thought that record was was, was pretty good, uh, but like. Like especially the mixtapes that came that mixtape that say, came out before. That were good, but yeah, like, yeah, how can you how can you mix, how can you out rap your album on a mixtape? Like yeah, and that's <laughs> like, like, Wale. I feel like I feel like the problem with Wale is like maybe he like had a lot of ideas early on, but then like ran out at some point or something. You know what I mean? Like he just kind of like lost steam in a way that like I don't know. It was weird. He also put out a lot of music in a short amount of time with mixtapes and shit, and then just like kept putting out subpar everything after well, that. early music. while they did have some really interesting music choices too but it, like you know from the dc area he did he had a lot of go-go drum stuff you know yeah on his earlier records which were interesting like that wasn't necessarily done in like hip-hop music before you know and those were interesting choices but like you don't have those now like it's all straight up knee deep in like the pseudo synthy Maybach music group type of aesthetic you know, yeah. and uh, I don't know. I'm just not, I'm not into it. But JPEG Mafia did a great job. You know, one of the best because of the year. never had like his own style. You know, like I feel like a lot of rappers with longevity kind of introduce something new. I might not always like it, but it's new. Right. And like Wale, I never really remember introducing anything new. He kind of came up at the same time as J. Cole. And the whole gimmick was like, not really a gimmick, but like his whole deal was like, I'm a good rapper. And like yeah. J. Well, Cole's whole gimmick when he came out was like he's like he's supposed to be like the new Nas or some shit like yeah. that. And yeah. he and wasn't. Like, <laughs> J. Cole and Wale came out around the same time and I feel like J. Cole was better. And so there was only so many people in that lane of just like good technical rapper, you know, that you're gonna be a fan of and kind of like stand and like J. Cole won. I don't really like J. Cole either i feel like he's way overhyped and you and i've talked about this on several occasions but like of the two i think he's substantially better than wale oh yeah i'll fast listen to a j cole record before i listen to a wale record absolutely like no question and i know that because i've listened to several j cole records and i've (laughs) never listened to wale (laughs) yeah i listened to several j cole records once (laughs) yeah i don't listen more than once but i listen you know i'll check it out see what i'm missing out here you know maybe not his last like I haven't listened to anything since like Kids on Drugs. I haven't listened to I haven't listened to the fall off. I definitely listened to KOD though. I listened to KOD, that's what I mean. That was the last one I listened to. And after that, I was kind of over it. It just yeah. it, I don't know. He's not, he never resonated quite with me. I feel like it's really his fan base that makes me dislike it though. Because and like I don't know, he definitely has like an ego that isn't fun. Like it's like too serious or something. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like he kind of sucks the fun out of the room a little bit. Like, Kendrick is more, like, uh, there's more humility in Kendrick's music and, like, more fun in it, even though Kendrick is the person who could seriously be dead-ass serious 24-7 and people would be okay with it because he's just so good and, like... Well, Kendrick 
knows not to take him so seriously 24 7 either exactly you know? and like j cole does like i've never seen j cole like like joke like he's always just dead ass serious about everything <laughs> but he's much better when he's a feature artist in my opinion like His feature, yeah he has good features i mean there's a lot of people like that though like honestly little wayne for the past like few years oh, has been oh, the God. best feature artist and terrible on his album i can't stand his albums but his features are fucking incredible so you know i mean I mean, some of his features this year are some of the best rap verses I've heard this, you know, in like the past. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, best, the best part of the Drake album was like Lil Wayne and Rick Ross, in my opinion. Yeah, the you best. Part, I mean, the best verse on Tyler's album was Lil Wayne. Um, he did another really, who was the other verse he was on recently? And it was so good. He had another one too that was like sick, but. I also, I have a lot of problems with Lil Wayne's politics and I can't totally separate that out. So I just. Didn't he have a single with a uh, Playboy Cardi this year? Did he? I doubt it. Cause I like, I listen to a lot of Playboy Cardi. I don't remember that. Mm. I feel like I would have listened to that. I don't think so, but. Or was it Young Thug? It might've been Young Thug. It probably was Young Thug actually. Mm. Young Thug would make sense. Cause Young Thug just released Punk. Yeah. I bet it was Young Thug which I listened to part of that album and it was really good, but it's a lot slower than I expected. And I was like, oh, I am not in the mood for like drumless young thug. Like I need a, <laughs> I, I need to be a little bit more chill for uh, that. There, there's been a precedent set for drumless rap songs. And <laughs> right. so coming for a minute, you know, you know. Actually, young thug is a good enough, like, I wouldn't say lyricist, but he's a good enough, like rapper, maybe singer. Like he, he's so, his voice is so unique that it's just fun to listen to him fuck around with it. Like, I enjoy Young Thug because of his voice. You know what I mean? He just does cool shit that, like, you don't really hear often. And, like, that's pretty fun, you know? But, uh, yeah, I get that. But I think uh, other people are catching up. I think Gunna is catching up really well. Oh, no, I don't, yeah. I don't like Gunna. I feel like Gunna is horrible. I really don't like Gunna. But, like, he, at least from a popularity perspective, is certainly – I mean, granted, that's because Young Thug puts him on, like, tons of songs and shit to keep him in the spotlight because that's on his um uh what is it slime uh what's his fucking label called not slime uh, like that was their uh like giant compilation yes yeah that's yeah, in part of some of the mixtapes as well and yeah but he he keeps gun on shit constantly for because that's kind of his cosign or whatever but but yeah i suppose we should get chat talking about this album huh okay yeah so let's joy that some songs on this have been okay. So first of all, like I'm Lee Nelson B, uh, host of Talent with Ellen. Uh, this is Super Destroyer, uh, you know, de facto leader of uh, Lonely Ghost Records, solo artist, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sometimes graphic designer and video editor of this sometimes. very podcast. So uh, <laughs> Harsh, guest podcast host, <laughs> podcast guest, uh, you know. <laughs> and this is your second record of the year. Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, and so it is, but like both <laughs> records are being recorded around the same time, like such joy I've been working on and off on this album for like literally seven years, some of those songs. So like, Oh well, yeah, I yeah. remember me and you going back and forth on a sorry, I ruined your birthday. I think around this time last year, I think, you know, it was, um, yeah, it actually was around this time last year. It was like September, October, but then void and outer space disco lemonade have both been in the work since before I knew how to play guitar. I started working on those when I only had a synthesizer and a drum machine. And um, then I just kind of didn't really know, I never knew what to do with them and they were a lot longer and like different sounding and like, uh, yeah. So like I, I want, I kind of, I have a tendency to revisit like super old stuff that I've, I has always stuck with me. Like I like this song, but it's not done. And I'll like revisit it every couple of years hoping to finally figure out what the fuck I'm missing from it. So like those two are those kind of songs. Um, and then the rest of them, uh, Analog Nightmares is like two and a half years old. So that one I actually recorded for that album that I never put out. Um, uh, it's Boring Without You Here, kind of the Lost Super Destroyer album that I do pluck songs from from time to time and like rework. And that was one of those. Um, so really, I mean, three of the songs on the album have been in the works for over two years and then a few of them kind of came newer yeah 
Oh, and that's a uh, man. I think all of them are. All the new ones are kind of longer. You know, um, and even though all the old ones are kind of longer, uh, um, the, new, the newer yeah. ones are kind of shorter. If be, except for uh, some are throwing me trash. You know, and that's that was like, old too. That's right. That song was written almost at the very beginning of Super Destroyer. So oh, okay. like, that's four years old. That song. So only half the album is newer than. You know, only half the album is newer than two years old. I've worked on, and I've just kind of reworked the songs and fixed them up and, and tried to figure out like how to finish them. Yeah. And Trippy Death, I, I know that's been, that's been a while, has been cooking for a while. Um, you know. No, actually, believe it or oh, not. Was it? Or was yeah. I, oh, no, I'm mistaken that for, for songs that people don't have access to anymore. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> that's actually, um, that one is, I recorded that one in the afterlife back to back in. November, December of last year, maybe even January of this year. So, yeah, those were newer. Croquet was the newest one on the album. That one was the last one I recorded because it kind of was like missing something. And mm -hmm. I felt like it needed a little bit of like a piece, of, like something a little bit lighter. And it like kind of fit into like the story of the album or kind of like what the album was discussing and covering. And so like that was kind of the last piece that I felt like was missing. So that's the newest one. And that was recorded this year. Um, and it wasn't too long after trippy death and afterlife but it definitely was after them so they probably were last year okay so yeah, i'm not going to get into like which genre this occupies i think other writers who are smarter than me have like had that discussion i mean know, i don't and, know to answer that anyway you know and, and, <laughs> reviewing, and reviewing yeah. your work so i'm not even going to try and tackle that you know like because like i said people who are smarter than me have had that discussion and drama really doesn't matter to me as Either, as, obviously <laughs> so yeah, you know so in some ways i hate that there's a there's any you know i was going under that post genre kind of moniker or, or like title and uh even taylor pointed that out and that's still kind of probably what i mostly consider it as i feel like it can fit into fifth wave to try to make it like somewhat recognizable to somebody that wants to hear it like what am i getting into i felt like fifth wave is like the easiest like heuristic for that right like what it you know something weird and synthy but like kind of emo -y still or whatever but really i don't really consider it fifth wave i, I do consider it like post genre i feel like the diversity in the genres is a little bit too extensive to really consider them to all be kind of lumped under anything you know well there's very few genres of music that that, that are just amalgamations of everything you know what i mean like yeah, if you say yeah. if you say hip-hop you're you're literally you're literally saying well uh, an amalgamation of of a whole lot of genres in music you know well, exactly like and the problem is like i feel like that's kind of what fifth wave kind of became was really just like the the like rock version of that kind of but not really i don't know it's tough you know like i think genres don't matter the way they used to because like when you're at a record store that's to me why genres are so important like if i wanted to hear a punk album i needed to know where the fuck to look you know there was finite amounts and if you're looking through records trying to try something new obviously you're gonna you're gonna try to go by genre and even then i mean you could find a punk album that was gaslight anthem you could find a punk album that was the unseen or you know the exploited or something like street punk or you know gutter punk or thrash punk or you could have like gaslight anthem which is really almost like uh indie punk you know well, kind of. well, well i think radio formats need to be you know addressed too because that's what genre is like especially if you're a record label and you're trying yeah. to submit i remember hearing a story about macklemore and ryan lewis for the heist and when they submitted um what was it uh thrift shop like they submitted to rhythm and blues formats before they submitted it to hip-hop formats and like like those I, I i guess i guess you can argue in that sense genre is useless you know you, you, so, you're like you know what i mean but the way I would view that is like, I think the interpretive lens or like the stage you set for something to be received really changes what people will hear or see and what you're giving them. So like, to me, like kind of sometimes that's interesting is like, if you do kind of align yourself with a genre that would be less characteristic of maybe the sounds that you have and allowing people to see that influence as the main one and seeing the innovation in it versus calling it something that's more closely aligned where I think people will ignore the innovation. Like if I call Such Joy a punk album, you know, I think that that changes it versus if I were to call it an electronic album, which is to be perfectly honest is more what I consider it to be. But like, 
you know, if I call it electronic album, it's really interesting probably to look at it from that lens and be like, okay, what makes this electronic? Well, every song has a loop in it. You know, every song has some synthetic or like, synth, you know, synthesizer type element or drum machines or something that's being manipulated. And like, uh, even if they sound like rock songs, you know, and like, um, I think Trippy Death could be the exception to that other than the guitar is looped for one part. Um, but, you know, like, I feel like that's kind of an interesting angle. So in that way, I think like genre, you know, I, not to get into the weeds too much, but like when I was working on my school shit, like in my professional life, genre, I had to define genre and I had to look at the ways that people utilize genre to create interpretive lenses to try to understand works of art. And like, so I think about that a lot in the ways that like genre is just that, right? It's kind of like trying to tell you and set the expectations of how you should consume something. And I feel like that's the only usefulness for genres. How should I consume this? And like, that also poses the challenge, right? Of like, what if I don't want you to consume it in that way? And that's what frustrates me sometimes. Like, I don't want people to consume this as like an emo album or like, I don't want people to look at, you know, a lot of the projects on our label and kind of put them into those boxes. Cause I feel like they ignore some of the parts that really make the album have the personality it does but I don't know how you fix that you know so in that way I agree but I also think it can help if you try to be strategic about it you know well that in culture takes a takes takes a point too yeah. you know like like when me and Gavron were talking we were talking about uh show uh, was it show crow all I want to do is have some fun why today it will be a country song but in the 90s it was an alternative song yeah. You know, because like right, yeah. the That's alternative stations are going to be more receptive to it and not to mention country fans are not going to be that receptive to it which is why like Macklemore, Macklemore and Ryan Lewis yeah rhythm work makes sense because you know you're competing with Good Kid Bad City at this point <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean like yeah. you're not going to win that battle you know, yeah. it, you know yeah. rhythm and blues though that, that those, those will work for you you know what I mean that's like exactly. you know I'm going to and from work stations not you know I'm putting us on at home type type of station. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. And I mean, like, I think like, you know, that cause you kind of obviously speak to me a lot and we talk about label shit and whatnot, but like, that's always the challenge for the label of like, kind of trying to figure out like, you know, how do we present some of this stuff? Because to me, all these bands do fit together, but I think to an outsider, the less, like the more genre you start to look at things, the less that might make sense to you. But like we share a lot of the same influences, we share a lot of the similar like, pre you know, preferences for synthesizers or certain types of rock influence in our music and stuff that like, you know, I think is always there. But like maybe not always the showcase or the point, and people want that to be the point. And so like that's always you know, like technically you know, such joy was referenced as a pop punk album, but I don't talk about pop punk things. So like again. From that perspective, it's not really, and I don't think it's like a totally a pop punk album either, but there's elements of all that in there, you know? So like, I don't know. It's one of those things where it's just, yeah, genre can be weird. I hate genre, but at the same time. Well, you're not thinking about it when you're creating, you know? You're not, yeah, it's not something you think, yeah. Yeah, like I'm never gonna sit down and say, I want to make this type of genre song unless the idea is to pick a genre. Like my next album, I picked pop punk, knowing that it was not gonna really sound like a pop punk album, but it would be fun to try to, use that as sort of parameters that I stick within while I make the album of like, how can I still keep components of this that could maybe unify something, you know? And like, that's the kind of stuff I've been playing with lately just cause it's fun to try to like kind of set new parameters or ways of doing things that you try to experiment with versus just like total free for all, which I think can be more fun, but like more challenging to put together as a body of work sometimes. So you know, there's that. And plus, uh, yeah, if you want to hear a funny story, the first genre argument I actually got into was over Daft Punk. What genre was Daft Punk? What did you argue? Out of curiosity. Like, like, like when I, when I like back in what was it like 2000, 2001? You know, and I'm. And this is my first time hearing hearing a uh, discovery and hearing Daft Punk and going back and hearing like homework or you, you know what I mean, like, and uh, like. For my virgin ears to this sound, I called it techno. You know what I mean? Right. And somebody no, was somebody could that. somebody could not wait. <laughs> no, just, that's not, <laughs> could that's not, not wait to be like, oh, 
you don't you're, you're you're a poser, man. You don't know you don't know what you're talking about. Like I was, this shit's dope. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, <laughs> I mean, it has like house components to it for sure. I don't really know what people would have considered. I would consider it like house more than techno, but like I didn't even, know what a house was. I think I fucking knew what a house was. <laughs> like <laughs> So There's like when one. I was a kid, believe it or not, the very first type of music I was probably like remember being exposed to was house. So like house music was like the thing that set the stage for me for my entire life. And then it went from house music into 90s alt rock. And I guess everything makes sense in that moment. As I say that, when I'm talking about sitting here talking about such joy and, you know, those are like two, I was exposed to electronic music and 90s rock. And, you know, that was like grunge and pop punk. So I guess like, you know, yeah. What I knew was dance music and house and techno music. Okay, that's that's what I knew at that time was like '90s popular dance anthems. You know, like, well, dance you know. and house kind of were like synonymous back then too. But like '90s fucking house music, like late '80s, early '90s house is still, I think, some of the best, most fun fucking music. It holds up. It just like captured a certain vibe that's like timeless. It's so. I would love to see somebody revive that, like like truly revive it, where it's like the funk element of those early house songs and like that early house movement, you know, there was a lot of like funk in there. There was some hip hop influence in there and it was really fucking cool. And I feel like nobody really does that. They all like evolved past into like hyper electronic or whatever, but like, you know, there's something to be said well, for like. I think Ready for the Weekend, the Calvin Harris record pretty much did a great job of. I don't know. I just. Sounded like a nineties, a nineties dance record. I you know? have to revisit it, but like, you know, CNC Music Factory, something like that is just. Oh man. What I'm talking about. I want that to fucking come back. Let's fucking go, baby. You, you want like, the chill? Just, you want chill, Rob G version of "I Got the Power"? That's <laughs> yeah, exactly. man. Fucking well, yeah. Space Jam soundtrack shit. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, dope. like honestly, like, and what's greater is like some of the deeper cuts of that time were fucking crazy. Like they were so good, and I feel like they were ahead of their time, and like nobody ever really, I don't know. It was like very quickly forgotten i don't see a lot of people like the songs weren't all forgotten because of like they were popular per se but like nobody really talks about well they merge into other genres like like it's also really diverse that scene and it's like a very diverse scene at a time when people were extreme like you know like gay people and people who are transgender or people who were non-gender conforming you know people who you know did drag and things like that were all kind of a part of that scene as part of its like fabric like that was part of that culture and like that was at the time when like AIDS was being demonized and you know being gay was synonymous with that and people were like super super bigoted and like then there was this weird little scene that popped up that was like super inclusive that was just about like fucking partying or whatever and well it's not as inclusive as you might have thought because remember uh good vibrations well that's Marky Mark that guy fucking yeah 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 but like and there's like more there's more examples of like singers being switched out for like you know really thin really thin people in the videos and shit and live oh, performances you're talking about, yeah yeah i guess yeah, I, was, uh, I was getting more at the uh just like the music the people creating the music. culture around the music yeah it was very inclusive yeah. and but yeah you know. for, the, for the commercial stuff i mean we're we're still a racist nation now so we're, <laughs> like, we're not gonna let you know we we're super racist in the 90s people don't give it enough credit for what it was um you know, it was. Yeah, but you're not gonna get away with like you know passing off you know Vivica A. Fox as Lizzo nowadays. <laughs> you know. So, <laughs> no, was, I mean, you know, but also someone like v- Millie Vanilli wouldn't have lost their career for lip syncing. So you know, there's a lot of shit where it's just like it was such a different like image was so important because people kind of forget that that like was kind of like the advent and heyday of like music being in in like television imagery kind of being married like mtv came in the 80s the music video was a new concept and into the 90s is when it like became popular so like you know it's kind of weird to think about but like the notion of like television as a means of like the perpetuation of cultural identities and beliefs and like hyper consumerism and things like that were really like hitting their stride in the mid 80s so like the 90s were kind of like the like polished final form of that initial movement and now we live in the hyper capitalist version of that where like you are in fact the product and your exact mere existence is a product but like back then you know music was a commodity but maybe you know, the team- it was highly controlled too what it was highly controlled too like the image highly itself controlled. was was highly controlled yeah i yeah. remember like, uh like whitney houston 
Oh yeah, like if like, she had hyper- a Twitter back in that day. Oh man, oh. She would never have had a career, the career that she had, the way that they portrayed her. Now it never could have happened. Oh. Like the lack of cameras and like constant whatever on her. Though obviously paparazzi and stuff was a thing. Like the lack of that, I feel like is the only reason. Because like. I always thought Bobby Brown got her into like the hard stuff and it turns out it was the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. It was you know? the other way around, buddy. Yeah, It was the other way around. And so like, which, you know, that's, it is what it is. Like they're not the only people to do Coke or crack or whatever. It was the eighties and nineties. I mean, everybody was doing some, fu- you know, like fucking some form. Yeah. Of but coke. those people didn't have Twitter. They didn't have social right. media. But they were allowed, you know, especially Whitney Houston, her whole image was so fucking clean. You know? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, the preacher's wife was like her like yeah, her second exactly. movie and shit like come on exactly. <laughs> like it was far from what reality was yeah and so like you know like it's crazy to think about but she was hyper controlled like the way that she was allowed to do public appearances or not like who was like you know they they kept a tight leash on on whitney she was not allowed to do a lot of things in public and she had people watching to make sure she wouldn't i mean know? there was a time where there was like a bidding war of who's going to premiere Michael Jackson's video for black and white on primetime television. Like, yeah. and I think Fox got to do it. And I remember that night, like it was like a half hour long, man, that music video. Yeah, you know? it's, 20, it's like 24 minutes. Yeah. It, 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 honestly, it's such a funny concept. Cause like now it's such a shitty video, but like Michael Jackson went all out. Like his videos were like little films. That's that part is impressive. Like smooth criminal. That was another I, one. That video is long as fuck. Fucking uh, thriller is like a 12 minute video. I mean, well, they yeah, have- Swift Criminal, that was a series, right? With like, uh, with Billy, with Billy, uh, Billy Jean, weren't they like, yeah, yeah, in the same, yeah. in the same like storyline of music video? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, they were neat. And like, they were all long. Like, you know, I mean, he was kind of, and honestly, that's what I think would be really cool to bring back is like the, the notion of like short film slash music video, kind of like what Kanye did with, um, the beautiful dark twisted fantasy yeah with runaway and everything yeah I those... would love to do something like that with like uh such joy just like come up with a little short film where the the music just plays to something that's like made for the music to be playing to kind of thing i think that that's that's a fun concept and it's just a cool way of representing like music but you know if you have a vision like that then yeah sure if you have like a story or an idea like i don't know it's fun sometimes i i think that that was that actually was cool you know? yeah yeah it was yeah the phoenix and everything yeah and having a painting on the record too like that but yeah it all tied together into yeah. a, a nice little narrative package yeah and that's probably the last time that that's gonna happen you know what i mean like hey we can bring it back baby lonely ghost 2022 let's go um, let's go i might so, so okay so on, on with this record <laughs> that way that we're supposed to talk about yeah uh, <laughs> Okay, the afterlife is a mil- is a millisecond perceived as an eternity, yeah. even though, it, like for me, this is where the mantra of the record comes from. You know what I mean? Like it is. Yeah, this is the thesis statement of the whole album. Yeah, this is. This so is, this, even yeah, the title is, is part of that idea in this one. You know, like, like I I made the instrumental first, and I knew I had at that point, um, you know, I had had a lot of songs in the work, and I knew that it was documenting suicidal ideation and depression and like kind of like the ways that that has impacted different facets of my life but the ways that different facets of my life also impacted me to kind of perpetuate that feeling you know like um and and so like that song was kind of just like I was like stuck in this shitty job I was working like literally 90 hours a week I was literally just like waking up to go to work to get home from work and to go to bed and I had no feeling of like being a person anymore and I just thought about like you know I'm fairly vocal about my my issues with capitalism and um to me it was just like uh, my life felt like it was like the perfect perfect representation of what hyper capitalism is which is like you are your job and that is your identity and you know I think a lot of people make their peace with that by this idea that like hey you know I'm gonna die and I'm gonna go to heaven and like I'm doing my deed you know I'm doing my good deeds in society I'm I'm contributing to society. I'm being a productive member. I'm putting this and that, and I will be rewarded in an afterlife. But like the afterlife is not real to me. So like to me, everything that you're ever going to perceive has to happen while your brain is fucking receiving oxygen and blood, you know, while your fucking neurons are firing. So to me, it's like, yeah, like, no, it's that afterlife that everybody seeks out is really the fleeting thoughts of your brain that will be extended to an eternity because you can't perceive death, right? So like you can't perceive anything after your brain stops. 
And so I start, I have that title and then I kind of wrote the song after. And it's obviously about feeling very aimless and drifting and just like consumed by my cats in the background, uh, consumed by, um, you know, just, just working away your life and realizing that like time is the only commodity you can't get back. And yet I'm going to work so that I can sleep in a bed so I can get to work. And like, what the fuck am I doing? You know? So yeah. And I've been really fucking right with uh, Person Pitch by Panda Bear. I've loved that album for like over a decade. Um, and I love his vocal harmonies. And he did this like fucked up Beach Boys on acid sort of album with Person Pitch. I don't really think he ever did again, to be honest. But like there was a lot of um, influence in that album from Pet Sounds. And I don't really like Pet Sounds. <laughs> I don't like the Beach Boys. I understand why people say they're psychedelic and I totally can understand and hear that, but like it's fucking too uh, vanilla, too cheesy, too. I mean, most of most, uh, Beach, Bo- Beach Boy, the greatest of Beach Boys to me lies in their production team. You know, if. Uh... Well, so Brian Wilson, I mean, Brian Wilson, so like Pet Sounds was called Pet Sounds because Brian Wilson literally recorded vocals in different spaces with different acoustics to create those different sounds and the harmonies and the way that his voice sounded. So like, I mean, he does deserve a lot of credit for that aspect, which was unique and very much, I mean, I do agree that the vocals are kind of psychedelic in that way. And I very much enjoy that, but I like Panda Bear's interpretation of it much better. And it sounds a lot more psychedelic. And I thought, you know, what if I could make a psychedelic like punk album? You know, like what if I could take this and like make something that sounds like you're kind of like, Initially, the idea was melting. Like, how can I make something sound as if it's melting as you go? So it turns from like this really crunchy kind of rock sound into something that just slowly devolves into synth. Um, And then uh, water kind of was the replacement for it. I started thinking of it more as like, oh, this is kind of watery. I should try to lean into that. And so when I, you know, I kind of even told Daniel when he was doing the, the mixing and the mastering and everything, the engineering, I was like, hey, I want this to sound like water. And we kind of went back and forth on what that meant. And I recorded it to kind of sound like water too, with all the vocal layers. You know, I wanted it to sound very ethereal and, and like you're floating. And I didn't want it to feel like the album is about lacking structure and like lacking stability. And I want the album to feel like that too. And so like the idea of like sinking in the water without hitting ground was kind of a good metaphor. And I think that comes that comes through really well in uh in Void and Trippy Death. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's like, that's kind of where you're so like my the way I view it is like outer space disco lemonade is like you're finally in the total abyss. It's super dark. You're alone with your thoughts. And then trippy death is kind of you touch bottom, you know, where it's like a little bit clearer because you have some bearing again even if it's, you know, this notion of the acceptance of, uh, of a fatalistic viewpoint and recognizing and, and trying to figure out how we, how to kind of fit the notion of mortality into your everyday life without it consuming you, you know? It's uh, half a discussion with myself, half a discussion with probably three other people that I know. Um, but yeah, like that's kind of the idea, you know. So, I, I just want to comment that uh, Kendra just—I just made a comment about lunar bowling, and and Kendra just asked me, "Is this an Ohio thing?" <laughs> like, is it? <laughs> is that, like, the black light bowling, right? Yeah, like yeah, I thought this was something every teenager. Yeah, not a thing everybody <laughs> used to do. That was like the coolest thing to do. Lunar bowling was like. It looked neat, you know? That, you was, had, that, that was like Friday night, man. Yeah, that was <laughs> like, like that or the roller rink, you know? Yeah. Man. But, um, yeah, I guess we're weird like that. <laughs> now, when it comes to croquet on fucking hardcore shit, when I first read this song title, I thought it was, <laughs> I thought it was croquettes, and I'm like, man, this motherfucker really likes croquettes. I mean, <laughs> I mean they're de- they're delicious, but yeah, like, man. So, <laughs> so the afterlife and trippy death were written. My girlfriend of like four years, briefly, she and I broke up. Uh, we were both just like, I think COVID just. She was finishing school. Uh, she kind of went back to school to start a second career. So she was like trying to finish that. I was working and, and doing like a dissertation and I was like kind of segueing into my job and it was like really brutal. And um, we just like kind of quit communicating and I felt really isolated and, you know, 
uh, things were just like bad. And so we broke up, she broke up with me and I wrote those songs during that time. And then we got back together and like a couple days, a few days later. And um, I'd been watching this show called Dick Town. It's like this 10, each episode is 10 minutes. It's a cartoon and it's pretty funny. I mean, it's kind of dumb, but whatever. And uh, it's actually like, uh, it's something that's said in that show. And I was like, damn, I want to do that because like I associate that show with like us getting back together. And that song was kind of like, to be honest with you, that song is kind of like me reflecting on this relationship that I almost lost and like thinking about when we first met and stuff like that. And kind of just like how we figured out compatibility and like, you know, having been recently broken up and facing the perspective of having to like date at this point in my life was like very scary and daunting. And I don't know, it just kind of like made me think about that. And it kind of fit into this, like, it's kind of like the final piece of like this miserable story where like things finally felt like, okay, she and I worked this out. We figured it out. We got it back on track. And like, that's kind of a good sentiment to have in the story, which is about a lot of my depression and the ways that it's been injected into that relationship you know, a suicide attempt and the fallout of that as part of it. So like, you know, that was like um, kind of the, like things have turned a page type of song. And it's kind of at the beginning because I felt like it fit well there to kind of inject like a memory into like a good memory into what otherwise feels very heavy, you know? And it contextualizes, I'm sorry, I ruined your birthday more. I felt like kind of, kind of like we met, now we're fast forward and things are bad, you know? But yeah, sorry, I'm sorry you ruined your birthday. If I recall, it's been 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 around for a while. It's been around for a year. It's be, I actually did not intend to initially release that song. I actually wrote that as an apology to my girlfriend because during COVID, I tried to kill myself, and she found out. I didn't tell her, which was bad, but I didn't want to freak her out because life was fucked up, and she was very upset. It gave us a lot of issues, and her birthday was right around the corner when she found out, and she like was devastated and I made a song to apologize to her and um I don't know we were in a different place and I felt like yeah you know what this song is like documenting the same like a big important part of like this whole story I'm telling so I used it um I had to clean it up and like re-record parts of it but I ended up using it um and she always obviously like was cool with that but you know <laughs> um, but like yeah so that was like a very personal song because it really wasn't originally written to be anything but that so um yeah i don't know like we went through it was a bad time it was all you know fucking covid got everybody i think in its own way but i didn't want to make it a covid album so i didn't like lean into that part you know with this record. what does it mean a covid album that's one thing i so many people just talk about like too bluntly. I feel like like so many people want to talk about the isolation of COVID. Okay. And I feel like that's not very interesting in and of itself. I feel like there's other elements to explore. And if you're not like on the nose about it, I feel like a lot of people will resonate with maybe some of the experiences without having to like make it all about COVID. Cause some of this is not about COVID either. Some of this is about bad feelings that extended clearly well beyond that timeline, but you know, yeah. yeah, because like some of us have no choice but to be isolated all the time, you know, for many reasons. And but, I mean, that's how I was for a long time. I mean, there was two years there where I barely saw another human being unless I was at work because I was like just working and, you know, sucked. And I was single at the time and it was like rough, you know, and that's where some of these songs were written it was that same kind of isolated period, but it wasn't, you know, government sanctioned. <laughs> it was just me. So. Uh, but. Yeah, you front loaded this this record with some with some heft with some weight. Yeah. Yeah. So, and w which you know is not because I I I don't remember um I don't I don't remember things are made out of things and those things are made of more things being this heavy at least on the front end of it. You know. Yeah, I mean, so I guess that album has like some punkier stuff, but it's not it's not yeah it's not emotionally heavy. Yeah. It's it's more political and and kind yeah. of just looking at the world around, you know. And this one, like, it starts off like, 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 I, want, I don't want to say slower, but definitely lower tempo, you know. Lower tempo, uh, you know, yeah, definitely. It's a lot slower. Um, I think it's slower. I mean, you know, obviously I pick it up at the end of Afterlife, but like, I wanted it to kind of feel, 
yeah, more ethereal, you know, watery floating in general. So I really wanted to set the stage and kind of maintain a slower pace throughout the album, not something so fast, you know? But in Lonely Ghost fashion, like, you definitely pick up the pace in that middle of the record, like almost smack dab in the middle. I'm fucking bored, you know. Yeah. I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, you know that I like to make songs that go from like let that like can give you whiplash because they go back and forth between tempos and like aggression and and things like that. And I feel like, you know, a lot of times I make these instrumentals trying to because I feel a certain way, so I make an instrumental trying to capture that feeling, and then I come back. To write like the lyrics so a lot of that stuff you know was kind of the conveyance of uh an emotion and then i found the lyrics that i thought would kind of capture that feeling without having to say i'm so sad all the fucking time you know like it doesn't well, I mean need- when you have song all. titles like you know the life is that the afterlife and and uh someone throw me in the trash right next to i'm sorry i ruined your birthday like it reads like Bojack Horseman show t- uh, episode titles, you know. I guess, yeah, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, but I guess like you know, I, I feel like I'm with this album. I'm trying to capture like the event itself and kind of the action in it versus the feeling all the time. Like I feel like the action sometimes, like the the uh, instrumentals are more feeling, lyrics are more like context or action. There's a lot of like happening versus just me talking about how I feel all the time, you know? Um, well, and that comes through with someone from being in the trash, because, like, you know, you, you, you go throughout the whole entire track at a, at, a ni- at a nice pace, and then all of a sudden the end of it is just, you just decide to smack people in the face with it. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and, yeah. and it's and, welcome. Know, it's welcoming. I like it. Like, and that was, the, that was the song that, like, originally, so that song was based on a suicide note, and then I, you know, I've struggled with suicidal depression most of my life and I'm good now I like went to therapy and stuff and I'm finally like not in that headspace but like I did struggle with it for a really long time and like that was kind of my way of like I wrote a suicide note and then I made a song instead and like it captured I feel like kind of where those tendencies came from for me which wasn't straight up like sadness it was like a feeling of like alienation for me more and like disappointment like I never could quite figure out how to fit into the places and spaces that were available to me and it's kind of like a a frustration partnered with an apathy a lot of the time for me was what did it it's just like I'm I'm uninvested in my own life to the point of not even wanting to have to go through another day of living it because it's so fucking tedious. It's just, there's no joy here. It's just purely me working and being like really isolated because of it and feeling like I never could be whatever. And so like that song is kind of like, you know, kind of like the ultimate version of those feelings, I feel like. And like, I know, and I knew you know, that those ideas were unhealthy and bad. And I tried to see the world in another way, but like, ultimately it's like my brain would always loop back around and end up back in that spot. And, um, you know, that was tough to try to finally, and I feel like getting older does help. Like as you get older, you just, I don't know if it's stability or if you just calm down or what, but like over time it dissipates to a certain degree. Like you learn how to not think that way and try to, that way right you like learn that your own interpretive lens on the world is very very powerful and you can choose you really can choose to see things in another context that doesn't always mean that things aren't bad or like that'll make things not bad but that doesn't mean that you have to navigate them in a certain way or allow them to affect you sometimes in the way that they do that's not always possible obviously like you know clearly but like i feel like with depression i learned that by like not um you know, maybe uh, entertaining some of the negativity and instead trying to focus on positive lenses through which I could view these negative events in my life. Like, what did I gain from this? What positive can I take away? Like, yes, I had this horrible experience, but like, did I learn something? Do I know how to make a better decision? Do I, ultimately, did I end up in a better position, which felt like a bad thing at the time, but ended up being a really good thing? You know, so like, 
that's this album is also me struggling with that idea of like that lens that I use, right? Like the glass doesn't have to be a half empty. It doesn't have to be half full. Sometimes there's just a fucking glass on the table and like, it is what it is, you know, don't fixate on the glass at all. And like, that's kind of, I think the perspective I've learned to take is like, don't fixate at all. You can acknowledge it. You see it there, move on, you know, like don't let these things stack up inside of you because eventually you're filled to the brim, you know? Well, um, in my, in my experience, it's more of like, the older I get, the more I'm able to recognize the dissonance in, in the way I think and my behavior yeah. and, or just in anything, like it, it be, whether it be like a friend acting shady all of a sudden, they're like, there's something's not right here. Like I need to do yeah. something about this that as opposed amazing. to ignore it. You know, like I used to do yeah. in my twenties because, you know, just like, Oh, what the fuck do I know? Like, no, I know, <laughs> I, I know, I know something's not right. You know, right. like, but, um, you know, I think that's what it is for me is that like when something when 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 something is vibrating at a different frequency, it's easier to call it out when you're older. I think so that's a good way of thinking. Of, I, I like that, like that idea of like incongruence, right? Like when I was like 24 or so, I realized that like I choose to be the person that I am and I wake up every day and I have to be me and nobody else does. So like I have to make decisions and I have to find a way to occupy this body, this life, this whatever, or to change those things that I can and to maybe again, you know, not in a religious way, but like let go of the things I can't, you know, like try to figure out like how to situate the modern world that is very heavy into it. And I struggle with it for a long time, but I think part of it is like also like knowing that you live by the values that you hold, knowing that you are making a positive, like actively contributing to something positive, I think helps like trying to think about the ways that you handle yourself versus the way everybody else handles themselves. And like, I feel like as you get older, you're much, you look inward more and more and really just try to say like, how can I be the version of myself that I want to see? And how can I be the person that I hope I can see out in society? And, you know, and I feel like when you do that, you attract like-minded people as well. Like, I feel like you, you know, surround yourself with people who are good people when you genuinely care about doing the right thing. Like, I feel like you do find those other people and it does make the world not feel as dark because, you know, you can know that you can trust other people, at least some of them. Not everybody's good, but there are people who are, you know, and like, those are the kind of things too, where I just feel like you can't hate yourself and find happiness and like I hated myself and wondered why I wasn't happy but like if I loathe myself I'm never going to put my you know treat myself in the manner that I should to actually find the people who are going to treat me the way that I want to be treated versus the way that I personally felt I should have deserved to be treated I was always finding those people who treated me badly because I hated myself so I that was like affirming for that notion you know like other people treat me bad that makes me feel like I should hate myself Versus recognizing that, like, maybe I'm just surrounding myself with the wrong people, you know? Well, if you're depressed and, like, you know, de depression begets more depression, you know what I mean? It really does, too. So you, know, so you feel at home in that way. It's, it's, there's a certain, it's scary to, to venture outside of that perspective after a while, because at least it's familiar, you know? Like, when you're constantly, like, like, at the very bottom, you wake up every day with a negative thought. And that's the first thing that happens. And that's the best thought of your day. And it only goes downhill all day long still, you know, like. Well, it's like when I, when I, when I, it's like growing up poor and also you can get money and you don't know what to do, you yeah. know, <laughs> like, like, like technically you know. this is a good thing, but I don't know how to, to deal with it. I don't know what to do. And like depression is like that, right. Where you're like comfortable living like that. Even if you don't enjoy it, you know what it is. And sometimes what's known as you know, like the basic human mechanism of fear is like what's known is always less scary than what's not known. And what if I really try to be happy and I can't find it? Now I'm going to feel even worse because there is no possibility anymore, you know? And like, that's a scary thing to think about, but also like you're in control of your own happiness to a certain degree. I mean, you have to be, you have to reframe the world. You have to figure out how you want to interpret the world. Bad shit is going to happen to everybody. It's always going to happen. It's always going to be there. The world is not a fair place. You know, people are bad. A lot of people are horrible. People will take advantage of you. They're going to treat you badly. I can't control other people. So like, I can't make somebody like me. I can't make somebody be nice to me. 
but you know, I can choose to avoid those people or find ways to find better people or join a different community. I can, you know, things like that. So that's kind of how I personally managed it. You know, just that mindfulness, being aware of my thoughts and what causes these feelings and trying to remove some of those stimuli from my life so that, you know, oftentimes it's like, when you do it, you're like, why the fuck didn't I do that sooner? You know, this person's toxic as fuck, but why was I keeping them around? Like, <laughs> you know, that's kind of, yeah. It's a lot of, this is a big mental health album for sure. Well, not to mention like the drums on uh, someone throwing me in the trash, the, at least at like, the end of it, uh, some of the best drum playing I, I, I've seen, I've had heard on one of your records. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm glad you think so. <laughs> they're, they're very chaotic and they were actually, uh, they go with the, the vocals. I like kind of timed them to the vocals more than the, you know, the guitars at points. Cause I thought that would be kind of chaotic sounding. So I was like, I was pretty happy with how that turned out. That song is my least favorite song in this album though. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't know what it is about it. Um, I don't know, just something. It's just not, I, I don't know. I don't know what, what it is. It's just still, it's just my least favorite. Well, and yeah, <laughs> Analog cool. Nightmares. And I love the swing on that one. Like Analog Nightmares might be my favorite one. Yeah. yeah if it's not my favorite, it's my second favorite for sure. Yeah. Like it's one of my favorite songs I've ever made. You know, it's um weird. So. And like, the, uh, just like everything seems like very like, like purposeful, you know what I mean? That yeah. has been placed on on the on this particular song, as opposed to the chaotic nature of the of the of the latter half of the last one. You know what I mean? Which is kind of, you know, yeah, that was kind of the the way I kind of wanted to see this. Like, after that song, there's two options: you have to go as hard, or you need to totally switch direction. You know what I mean? Like, like you can't just come back in with like a mid tempo fucking rock song. That shit's not gonna work. It's just gonna sound lackluster. So I was like. Analog Nightmares is a weird song. It's kind of intense. And um, it's built on a chaos later using guitar. I played guitar into a chaos later and like sampled it, messed with the speed, messed with how long the measures were to like isolate certain notes and kind of like glitch it out throughout. And I did that with the lead and the rhythm. And then I played the rest uh, with synths and stuff like that. That wasn't looped. And, um, and I slowed it down at the end and stuff. But yeah, like it's just... Um, it's supposed to be about frustration, obviously. And I felt like that song, like the glitchiness of it and kind of like the stuttering of it kind of really captures the feelings of frustration and like kind of like the synth like punching out at times in there. It's like this weird, like kind of aggressive sound that's not like, it's a very aggressive song for a song that's not aggressive, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, it puts at least, it has that sort of, like if this, like you didn't have a pitch down snare and it feels like super clean and super like you know polished and compressed and everything yeah. like it would have came off clean like i was i was just i was talking to mary about how the two is like the most important part of like any rap song you yeah. know as opposed to the as opposed to the one that the two where the snare lands is usually yeah. where consonants land and everything and it informs you a lot about the record and having a pitch down drum gives you a lot of the like imp like what the mantra of the record is going to be, or at least what the emotional tambour is going to be like, you yeah. know, and I de you definitely yeah, feel that with analog great. nightmares. For sure. Yeah. If it was like a brighter sound and stuff, it would be a different song, you know, like it's, that's kind of what brings it, mars it down into like this muckiness and like, you know, the song kind of, kind of has like two feelings throughout. Like the first half is frustration and the second half is kind of like letting it go you know, like acceptance and trying to move forward. And um, it's kind of like trash and analog nightmares are kind of like two shifts in perspective that occur very quickly in line with each other. But it's kind of like a shifting of perspective. It goes from like depression into anger, into frustration, into acceptance, you know? And like, um, like void is more like, like kind of like, that feeling of acceptance comes with a certain there's like relief followed by usually like sadness you know what I mean and like void is very much that feeling of like I'm willing to accept I'm alone you know but it's not a good feeling into outer space disco lemonade which is kind of that introspective like okay what the fuck do I do now you know but I feel like that's kind of like that middle part of that album really is kind of like where the perspective shifts you know 
Yeah, and it definitely like at least with analog nightmares and void, like it, you definitely get the. It, 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 now that you mentioned it, like you definitely does feel like you're sinking deeper. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know. You know yeah. Like, and like in, in a way, like with acceptance, like you know, it's kind of documenting my feeling of depression and like kind of what it's felt like. And like when you accept that nobody owes you anything, that your loneliness you have to accept the loneliness at some point, right? Like you can't be angry at rejection and you can't be fixated or frustrated by that feeling because it's always going to prevent you from moving forward. At some point you have to just like wish the best for other people and hope that you can find it too, you know? And like, that's kind of that idea. And then like, once you realize like I'm alone and literally I'm not entitled to anybody's affection, that is something I have to earn. That's also very scary and sad because you're fucking alone, you know, <laughs> like, like being alone is a scary thing, you know? And like, and I feel like when you accept some of those negative aspects of life, that's part of growing up. It's part of becoming a good, I think, person, somebody who is well-rounded, who is emotionally intelligent is like recognizing and, and becoming aware of those things. Like also like, it makes you very introspective and it makes you wonder like, who am I? Who am I really, right? Like once you let go of all of the shit that you blame on other people, once you alleviate them of blame and you accept your own responsibility for the situation that you're in, which doesn't say it mean you had to be a terrible person, but like maybe you made, you chose bad partners, you chose bad friends, you- Well, that's what happens when you don't get on the job training of being an adult, you right. know? Like <laughs> until you accept that, you can't really fix it. And so like- like, to me, it's kind of like that acceptance when I had that was rough. Like, you know, like I'm not entitled to anything and I can't be frustrated when other people who don't like, I'd rather be me and be alone and figure out what that means than try to be something for somebody else, which is never fulfilling or to be, you know, feeling of rejected and not being able to like, just recognize that like somebody will accept you, but like, you have to be you, you know, and you can't live your life trying to please other people. And um, yeah, so it's kind of like that sinking idea of like, you know, am I myself or the projection of other people's, you know, desires basically. Like that's kind of that idea of like, what does it mean to be a person? What is a personality? What is an identity? Multiple identities, you know? Can we view identity as a cohesive thing? Um, you know, how does the universe differ from person to person? when the entire understanding conceptualization of the universe is perpetuated only within my own brain, because the information that you hold in your brain and the way that you're going to stand, is going to be different than mine. And that changes the way the entire world is to you, you know? And like, I think that that's like a really important thing to remember. Like we're all living in our own little universe that is truly never going to overlap perfectly with another's. Like we're always going to be alone to a certain degree, but that's empowering if you want it to be. And that can allow you to find camaraderie maybe in a way that like, being unwilling to be alone or like an individual that's just like, you know, kind of stands on its own, you know, whatever. Um, I think that that can be really important. You know, you kind of have to be willing to be alone. <laughs> I know that sounds terrible, but like, I, I don't know. Hey man, I, I create alone almost exclusively up, up until very, very recently. That's how I, how I worked, you know, so but yeah, I, I, get, I get it. I'm a person who, despite my probably extroverted kind of tendencies that people see, I actually am a very introverted person. I can sit alone for days and it doesn't really bother me anymore. Like I'm okay with it. I enjoy my time. Um, you know, so like I didn't used to feel that way. The concept of like being by yourself was scary at one point. Like it's no longer scary to me. It's actually like, it can be very comforting. You know, so like, I think like, there's a certain fulfillment if you want it, but it's definitely not easy all the time. And I feel like that's really hard to do, um, especially when maybe you already struggle with depression and things like that. Like it can be really hard to be alone. So. Oh, I mean, I guess that's, that's, that's the mantra of void because you know, it's literally, literally what, what it's describing. You know, but like, 
the 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 vocal the vocal uh the vocal uh samples on that the slow down vocal samples because uh, I actually had the song taken apart earlier today and like it's what, what, a sad sounding sample oh no it's not a sad sounding sample when you hear it at its normal speed and it's not okay I did I did pitch it up there's just fine fine great what the fuck are they saying you know so. <laughs> Uh, I don't remember what they're saying actually. What are they saying, Nelson? Uh, one, I forgot what the first part was, but the second part is like come back, I believe. Yeah, the second part is come back. I know that, yeah. but the first part I can't remember. It's been so long since I sampled it, um, and I think it's reversed. The 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 initial like the first half of that sample. I think I flipped it also. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I, that's actually that's actually two clicks I can do right now. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah, that, that that's a uh, yeah, it, it, like. It seems like the song is built around those two, right? Those two samples. Everything is built off those samples, yeah. Okay. So like the whole song is built around it. Yeah. So that was kind of like the driving force. Um, I really liked uh, like that, like kind of pseudo witch house movement that came around with like XXYYXX in the like 2011, 2012 ish time, 2013, um, and kind of like good. I never got into them. XXYYXX, the, the, the self-titled album is one of my favorite albums ever made. Okay. It's one of the best albums. I've, it's so fucking good. Like, I, even thinking about it, I'm going to have to go listen to it now because it's that fucking good. Like, Witching Hour is maybe one of my favorite songs ever made. And it's just a sample of a guy saying, cuz, cuz, we talk to Satan, cuz, he listens. <laughs> so, you know, um, but like, it's a, it's a very, it's a very dark, depressing, emotional album with no actual singing, it's all vocal samples. And um, that was another album that like kind of inspired some of the more electronic stuff. Um, and then, you know, Outer Space Disco Lemonade kind of came out of uh, like some of that same down tempo feel, but it was like a happier, brighter sound. You know, it was a little bit less, um, less dark and, and, and dreary. If you it's will. definitely the bigger song, like just musically speaking. Yeah, uh, there's a lot more going on in that song. Like yeah. Void has probably, Void actually has a lot of layers because I layered the synths. So I think there's like three or four synth lines in there, plus the bass line and then, you know, the drums. And there's a lot of tracks in that song. But um, yeah, Outer Space Disco Lemonade is like a huge fucking, fucking song. So like, there's like a lot of different stuff going on in that song. To be honest with you, it's very commendable that Daniel was able to mix it the way that he did because that song is it has a lot going on. It can be very chaotic if you don't, you know, kind of pick a focus, if you will. Um, and initially, I had recorded that with the drum machine, and then I replaced it with live drums because I liked that sound better than the fully electronic sound, and I thought that would transition nicely into the the acoustic strum guitar that's really just like the beat for the second half, which is just a guitar being like muted and strummed. So like, I kind of like the way that that went. Those synths are actually layered too. Those like up, those like upbeat kind of off tempo synths or whatever you want to call them. Uh, um, they are uh, not off tempo. Uh, like syncopated. Yeah, there you go. Syncopated so, synths. Those are actually like two different synth layers together being played. So that kind of made that sound a lot like richer. And I really do love the way that they sound like that is a cool tone. I kind of want to layer more synths now because of that. I forgot I was experimenting like seven or eight years ago before I played guitar. I really liked layering synth lines. So like bass lines and things like that that were synthesized. I would like make like two or three layers to a bass line of different bass tones and kind of make them play together and apart and do different things with them. And uh, I started doing that with synthesizers as well. And um, like that was really cool. And then I don't know why I just kind of like I must have quit making music for a little bit or something and I kind of forgot about it. And now I'm like all on board to try to do it again. Cause I think that that sounds really like full, you know, like rich. I like that. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's I, I, when I first started the track, I was really impressed by it, you know, just not only by the sheer size of it, you know, but like how everything came, came together. Cause I know that must've been like a back and forth with, between you and, uh, you and Daniel, you know. Believe it or like, not, I think Daniel nailed that song in three mixes. He like kind of just understood it, like pretty inherently. He like kind of knew 
where to situate certain things. So really, I mean, it was like some fine tuning stuff, but nothing crazy. Um, and that song was actually a lot longer. There was multiple verses in that song originally before that end piece. And I kind of just like cut it up and changed it. Same with Void. Void used to be a three minute song. I cut it up and, and like really minimized it because I just felt like it wasn't warranted. It didn't need to happen. Um, so I kind of cut out all the fat on both of those songs. And I think it's, it almost makes it feel like it's shape shifting, you know? And I like that feeling. There's also well, the weird vocal samples in there. Oh, that, I, I mean, we talked about this before. Like I, I like, I, I don't, I, I don't need, you know, you know, like intro, verse, pre-chorus, chorus, post-chorus, yeah. you know, I, I much rather have like, I much rather have like 10 feet of clays than to have like a normal song structure. You know what I mean? Me too. Obviously, you know, like that's the other thing with Super Destroyer is like, I know how to make a regular song. <laughs> I don't know if anybody will believe that, but I do know in fact how to do like chorus, verse, chorus, verse. I guess croquet kind of well, has. You, 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 well, you've done it before and you've done it very well before, you know, like. But I, it's not fun. It's not fun to make that. Like, you know what I mean? Like a lot of the times I feel like there's a certain like stream of consciousness to my instrumental pieces that then eliminate that need for like the vocal piece, you know? So like I focus on vocals being more like structured and instrumentals being less structured in a lot of ways because like instrumentals, I feel like, again, try to capture a feeling and I try to like ride that feeling out for a few minutes and see like what, how does this transform, you know? And so like, it's more fun to make songs that do different things than it is to make songs that stay the same. I guess I could always like go from the end of something like Outer Space Disco Lemonade and bring the first half back in and maybe I'll try to do that in the future. But um. Yeah, I don't know. It's just not as fun. <laughs> so, oh, no, there, there's too many songs in DIY that are way too long for what they offer. There's too many and, songs in general that are way too yeah. long for what they offer. You know, like, I, I like a catchy song, but I do feel like a lot of times I do like the idea of cutting the fat and kind of just, like, focusing on hooks versus, like, structure. You know, like, have three different hooks in a song, which was kind of the goal with the song, like, I don't even know who I'm supposed to be anymore from home movies, was, like, let me make a song that actually never repeats itself, but try to make something that will be catchy. So let me make like a kind of like a hooky kind of chorusy thing. And then another one at the end, kind of back to back. It's like, what if I tried to make a song using only hooks, you know? Um, and that's like kind of more, I think where I focus my attention is like, can I make something that has like a hook or an earworm without it necessarily having to be a chorus? You know? Well, I think it depends on what ideas you're tackling too. Cause I can see somebody like, like uh, Robbie Rowe doing, doing uh, like those kind of type of songwriting things and on, on their project, but like for something like this, which is, I don't, I don't want to say raw emotion because it's very well presented and very well, like manicured and like the fat is gone. Like, but when you have like something that is like this much of like a concentrated emotional presentation. You know, I don't, I don't need it to be catchy. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, yeah. it kind of takes the sting away. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so, like, it, it, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't, I, don't, I think it kind of like takes away kind of like the, it, it, the presentation of such joy is, is the best that it could be. Well, I appreciate that, and like, I mean, like, there's definitely that too, where it kind of feels like bullshit to then go back around to a chorus. I already said it, like. You know, this song's about like killing myself. I don't think I need to re-sing the chorus. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, there is a certain aspect of that where it's just like it doesn't feel authentic to the the larger idea or concept or story or anything that's happening for me to do that. So, you know, the closest I get is things like on croquet, I kind of do the oh oh the first time and then have like lyrics over the second one, but the instrumental is more structured, you know, more traditionally, or like in analog nightmares, you know, I repeat myself with like suffering succotash. I don't think that this could last, like those kind of things, you know, where there's repetition, but yeah, it just doesn't, yeah, it would feel weird for sure. I agree. It, it was like something that really wasn't on the table for me. It never even occurred to me. I mean, like it wasn't like always an intentional reason. Like there wasn't always an intentional thing other than say like, this wouldn't, this wouldn't make sense. It doesn't sound right. So I won't do it, you know, but retroactively, I think it's because I like was trying to capture a feeling and it didn't feel right to then go back to something, you know? But. Yeah. And then uh, I, I love I love Trippy Death. Trippy Death is probably my favorite song on the so, record. Trippy and me, me and you have went back and forth on Trippy Death for a while because yeah. I, I think that's the one you asked me the most about, you know, before, before mm -hmm. when you're like recording it and doing demos and stuff. 
Yeah, that one. Um, yeah, that one. It has the loop guitar. Um, that dan -it, 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 it that I built the whole song around, and so it started as just those bright strums of like in the intro part, and it kind of literally evolved exactly how it sounds. Like it just slowly, as I was playing things, I like felt a need to start playing chords, or you know, like it just kind of like very organically evolved into the song that it was. There wasn't a lot of like like some of the other songs I had to really think about, especially like Void and, and Outer Space Disco Lemonade, like what is the structure for the song? Like, how do I make this? Like, how do I cut this and how do I situate? Cause like originally there's no guitar in Void. It was just synths. And then I cut out a lot of the synths and made them come in really late in the song to kind of add the texture and like add a more ominous sound at the end. And like, I had to put a lot of thinking into like, what do I want to do with this? Where like Trippy Death was literally like, I sat down, started playing that little thing and then a little riff, it's not even really a riff, it's too simple for me to even consider it a riff, really. It's like five notes. But then like, I looped it and just built the rest of the song around it. And it really just was like, I feel like I need to start jamming right here. And so I like added those, those uh, you know, chords at the end and stuff like that. But that one was the one of the most fun ones to make, probably. Like that one, just because it did happen so like spontaneously that it was just like super... I don't know. It was just like kind of like jamming in my bedroom, you know, <laughs> more than some of the other ones were. Well, yeah, that's that's basically how um, it's basically how uh, well, the last song on 2.0 got made. Like, yeah, the father of the year, the father of the year song. Yeah, yeah. That, that that's that's exactly how that got made. Was like I had I, I was yeah that was the last song I made. And literally, it was made like maybe like an hour before I sent it to you. <laughs> it was like, yeah. like I made it, mixed it, mastered it. <laughs> it probably was my favorite song on that album. Yeah, and literally, I had this song in front of me for like, for like a month, right? And I was trying to do Father Year stuff for like a month. And then on that day, where you wanted a record, and I'm like, I gotta do this. I gotta, I gotta do this. And all of a sudden, it just clicked like that. I heard like my first like. I heard my first sequence and I knew the rest of what the rest of this is going to sound like and and it, it just like came into place it had to be the right time you know yeah definitely and like that's uh oh sorry I just got a text I just ADHD man <laughs> get distracted but uh anyway um yeah so um but like that song you know, and that song also was kind of like one of the important ones for figuring out like how it was all going to come together. Because like, it's like the most direct conversation I'm having about mortality. And like, you know, this whole album is about kind of this idea of like suicidal ideation and extreme depression and like, you know, mortality and fatalism. And like, that album is kind of like trivializing some of those ideas to a certain degree of like, listen, like, you know, I'm kind of talking to myself a lot in that first half of like you don't have to get caught up on this like death is coming for us all it's really not a hard concept there's nothing to really understand it's just a fact of life right and like you don't need to get hung up on the process of dying because that means that you're eliminating the concept of living you know and so like I, I felt like um like that was a really like I was processing my thinking on a lot of these things. I was recently in therapy and trying to figure out like, how do I deal with these suicidal tenant, like ideas and tendencies and like, you know, and those kind of things. Um, like that was kind of like after I'd started processing that and like, what the fuck is going on in my brain, you know? And like, what frame am I applying? And like, that's kind of where that song came from. So I, I felt like uh, that was kind of like, like afterlife is the thesis statement and trippy death is absolutely the conclusion, you know? So it's like okay. the concluding paragraph of the album. So this album is like a dissertation on suicide, basically. Yeah, on suicide, <laughs> to be honest, such joy. I mean, you know, that was kind of the idea though. It's like a dissertation on, yeah, like on this, this fucking mental illness that I have struggled with for the entirety of my life. So like, you know, and, and processing that and really trying to, and it's like kind of exploring the notion of mindfulness. And again, just like the reframing of 
one's experiences and the reframing of the way that you like understand and perceive the universe. Like, I mean, again, that's all in your head. Like the universe is not a singular thing. You know, we yeah. do not live in a, in a, in a, in, in a single subjective or uh, objective reality. Like we live in 7 billion different realities. So, you know, it's kind of a, I find that that's a helpful way to perceive the world and think about it. You know, like the world, the universe begins and ends with me. Uh, and the universe I, that I, I, was, I was actually playing that game of the world ends with you <laughs> today. But was, in fact, uh, like mindfulness is the name of the, of the VA uh, mental health app. At least it was, mm-hmm. you know, and it's just like, it's like, a, it's a building block to changing your behavior when you go, when you fall into the patterns of, yeah, you know, that rabbit hole of depression is, you know, make sure you're being mindful of, of the thoughts that usually go down that path and try to, you know, rewrite your, yeah, your brain to go to another path. And it was, it was an app that you could go to, you know, to that help you think of other things when, you know, memories start coming back and shit like that, you know? So, so yeah, that, 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 that was, that, 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 that was interesting that you said that, you know, reframing uh, mindfulness, you know? Yeah. And like therapy helped me with that a lot. I mean, it's something I started doing on my own, but I feel like just having a person to talk to made it feel like you're not wrong or crazy or like, it's okay what happened and like what you're trying to do to fix it is actually like, not just you making things up. You know what I mean? So like, it was more about like going to a therapist kind of validated some of the things I'd started to do to try to address some of these issues and like really helped me to like dive into that. And to feel validated in that sort of thinking and practice of like, again, just like self-empowerment and the very, in the very realist sense of like, I am in charge of how I choose to experience the world. And that's not to say that I look around and see fucking rainbows and sunshines and flowers so much as it's to say like, you can acknowledge that the world can be or is still, in my opinion, a bad place, but you can also like not let that consume you you know, like, because you're not going to change it, you know, like, exactly, like, you can't change everything. And like, I and the trick is to make sure you're doing the things you can change. You know, you do those things, like you do make those changes, you do live by the beliefs or whatever that you have. And I think it makes it easier to believe that other people do that too. some people at least and like, you know, I'm still angry about the government. And I'm still angry about like, our fucked up society, but like, at least I can like, you know, still see something positive somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, I remember a conversation that me and you had at one point in time, like we're not gonna die a natural death. Like Yeah. <laughs> like like the our parents may be able to, but not us, you know. Right. And like, you know, that's probably very much true, but I'm not gonna think about it. I'll wait till it's happening, you know? <laughs> that's I guess the that's I guess where I landed was like There's such joy, right? <laughs> it's it's kind of like you know the title is like both ironic but also i guess in a way like a path to it you know like oh. my path to it Some and that's joy. one thing that's missing about music i think is irony especially when it, especially the we had a heavy reliance on it in the 90s as our as yeah. a point of reference for uh for rebellion you know everything from like the dissonance to the subject matter and the sound of like third eye blind and google doll songs you know, like to like Elena's Morris said, literally her biggest hit being irony, ironic, excuse me. You know, like, like it, it's a, you know, it, it's definitely, it's definitely much appreciated. You know, well, it's like one of those areas where like, I feel like in the nineties people took it too far because it like turned like racist jokes, ironic enough to like, people were just racist, but like, it was ironic. You know what I mean? Like it got too far, but I feel like like but when it, it started, it was like the way smart people talk to each other, you know? At least yeah. that's how that's how I that's how I perceived it. It was, but it also I feel like sometimes it was like maybe in bad taste, I guess is what I'm getting at. And like I feel like in this concept, it's kind of like nah. You know what I mean? Because it's like not me really trivializing anything, but you know, um, but yeah, like I, I kind of like the ironic title of it. Like that was like kind of the very last piece i didn't have a title for the album until i finished it and i had been singing like such joy about you know going to work so i could make money to go to bed to go to work and i was like ah yeah 
that's kind of is the thesis point of this whole fucking album. I'm just going to pop that bad boy on the title, you know? Um, so yeah, it was, uh, I don't know, like in a weird way, I swear to God, I'm happier as a person because I made this album. Like I, it helped me process and explore a lot of things. And when I listen to it again, it reminds me of it and is almost like a way of like keeping those things outside of me. You know, like I feel like I actu accurately was able to capture something that I don't want to have to have reside inside of me anymore. And I was able to like put it in this cage of an album. And I really am glad for that process. Well, no, things have a home now, you know, like, yeah. you know. So judging by the cover and the, the story of this record, am I to believe that you're not a good swimmer? I actually am a fantastic swimmer. <laughs> I was on swim team. Uh, I have been swimming since I was like three years old. Oh. But I almost drowned a few times in my life. So, you know, and I know that feeling of like being pulled under the water uh, you know, growing up by the lake, we've all had a scare or two, I'm sure, you know. Um, Not me, man. Swimming, so I'm definitely afraid of swimming. Oh, you are? I didn't. Oh, I was oh. surprised you lived fuck in water, man. We evolved out of that mess. I'm staying away. <laughs> <laughs> well, you lived in the lake. I just assumed you probably like hung out in the water a lot, like everybody I knew, uh, you know. Break, like, I'll go on a break wall and shit, but, you know, as far as like, you know, submerging myself into water, like, hell no. I'll take a bath. <laughs> I'll, I'll go in a hot tub. I am, I am, I am not going into like things living there. <laughs> things living there, and it is gross. But like, yeah, like you know, I've um almost drowned and stuff like that. And I just felt like water's a really good metaphor because it's like constantly moving. It's never you're never it never stops. Like if you're immersed in water, it's like this living, moving thing that's just constantly in motion, and you can cut through it, and you can be trapped in it, and you can sink in it, but it's still there. There's nothing you can do about it. You can push it out of the way though. You can manipulate it. You can, you know, navigate your way through it. And like, to me, that's kind of, you know, all part of it of like, you know, I don't know. I also think like of the notion of like air as a fluid and what that means and like this notion of fluid and like, I don't, you know, it's dumb. I'm not even going to get into all that because that's like- Well, stupid. glass is a fluid apparently, you know, so. Yeah, it is. You know, it's just <laughs> a slow moving one. And like, you know, a lot of things are. And so like, I just, you know, navigating the world is kind of just like sometimes it feels like you're trapped underwater you know but like you can move in it and that's important to remember too so you know but yeah and also the water I just you know it sounded like water I just felt like it should have a cover with water on it I took those pictures myself so that was hard as fuck <laughs> it took a lot of it took a lot of effort to get some of those pictures but um I was really happy with how it all turned out well, good, good. Uh, I, the, the cover looks dope. So, like, Thank you. appreciate that. Yeah, that was a really lucky fucking shot. <laughs> so, well, okay, I remember what I remember the 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 J cars you're 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 showing me early early in the in the development of the, of the cover. So, but yeah, this actually turned out. Yeah, yeah, the alternative cover with the water glass. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, and maybe I'll do the the remixes or whatever. Maybe I'll use those for the cover. You're, you're, you're formally announcing that now? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm just saying it's an idea that's out there in the ether. Oh, okay. A few may exist. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, any any uh, other formal announcements you want to make? Because I think there should be certain things out by the time this comes out. So. Well, the Halloween split should have come out uh, yeah. Tuesday because this will probably come out, what, next Saturday? Uh, yeah. Mm, yeah. Like, yeah, so next Saturday. Uh, so Tuesday, um, this past Tuesday, we put out Halloween Split, new songs from Leave Nelson B, Funeral Homes. Uh, uh, Ghost Fan Club, right? Ghost Fan Club, you, and another, well, Discussing the Sun, because that's already been announced now, which is your project with Clarissa, which is like fucking sick. It's not going to, we're going to wait to put that song up on streaming until we get a little closer to the release, because we're going to try to do a little something with it. But um, it'll be on Bandcamp and SoundCloud if anybody's interested. And that is like, that album's like, I'm really excited to put that one out. That song is like one of my favorite songs of the year, probably. That is absolutely hands down my favorite instrumental of yours you've ever made so far. The, um, the Halloween splits are home to a lot of good songs. They're also yeah. home to like weird songs, like stuff that like a lot of the times would not end up on an album because there's like not worth doing a whole concept or a whole album sometimes with, but they're like 
good songs that don't have a home kind of thing, you know? Why well, Neocortex wouldn't have made a would have made a Mr. Destroy record? Well, Neocortex barely counts because I forget that song. Was <laughs> um, but the only reason it's up on streaming is literally because uh, it was our first split. Otherwise, that shit would go in the same direction as all the demos I did. Same with Michael Bolton. The only reason I left that up is because I made it for my girlfriend. If I didn't, I would have taken it down. I'm eventually going to re-record that song. But like, you know, all those old demo songs, they need fixed up and re-recorded. And there's probably some stuff I'm still working on re-recording across the board with different songs. But um, yeah, like, you know, those Halloween splits are cool. And like the Ghost Fan Club songs are fucking great. Discussing the Sun is great. Like everything on there is just like really, really good. Um, I'm excited to hear New Funeral Homes as always. Um, yes. we also just did New You. They're Welcome to the LGR Family. They were released on Thursday. They premiered their new single, Like Automatic. Uh, very fucking good band. Very cool band. Very excited to work with them. Uh, Blake and I met because of that split that we did. Same with Caleb and hey, from Hey, I Love You, actually. That's how we ended up linking up with Hey, I Love You also. But we did that comp, um, not split, comp that we did, uh, the 90s comp. And I met Blake when he was doing Morning Collective and he actually came up with New You as a concept. He and I were talking about the name of that band because originally it was going to be called, uh, I think it was called Depression Nap, something like that. So, um, you know, it, it ended up kind of taking on a little life of its own and that was originally Blake's side project. And it's really cool to see it develop into a full band project and it's fucking really good. So, and we're still doing, and we still have uh, Wasp Factory tapes, right? Still got some Wasp Factory tapes. Go buy them from Wasp Factory's band camp, our band camp. Uh, we also have some Super Destroyer lathe cut vinyl. Let's get those out of here so I can get them out of my room. Uh, I, the tapes are sold out. Is that the, is that the vinyl that I have? What was that? Is that the vinyl that I have? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that uh, is, that, that's I a good one to have. It's Joy Run, but like, I don't know. We'll see. Um, we have some Super Destroyer coffee as well. Outer Space Disco coffee made by Solidarity Club, which is pretty cool. And then uh, we have a Famish single coming out on the second uh, ahead of their new album, their new LP, which is literally like one of the best albums I've heard this year, hands down across the board. Um, and that is coming out on the 19th of November. And it's fucking so good. You've heard it, right? Yeah, uh, I heard I the... Heard, uh... I heard a version of it that I'm pretty sure is not finished. <laughs> I'll send you the new one. Okay. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things we've ever released. Famish is like, if Famish wasn't on Lonely Ghost, they would be one of my favorite bands. And the fact that they're on Lonely Ghost means that they're one of my favorite bands and they're on Lonely Ghost. So, you know, usually one of the things I always forget to do with our best of, of our best of series, which I'm just going to say now, not, nah, you know, but like when I pick those, just to be clear, I leave Lonely Ghost off because that feels like a cop-out, like bullshit. But if I didn't, you know, like obviously our own albums would be like in my top five because like I literally put that effort into release them because I like them in the first place. So, you know, um, I do think we're putting out some of the best music I've heard this year as a label. Um, I, I think that we're only have even stronger offerings coming. We also are gonna have, you know, one final project in December of yours. I'm excited. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We do it. We do have yeah. that coming. It'll be, it'll, it'll, it'll be funny if we did our top, our top five. And my like top five is like you know, oh uh, hey, I love you, Internet Breath. Hey, I love you, Internet Breath, the cassette version. <laughs> hey, I love you, Internet Breath, the vinyl version <laughs> that I still have yet to get in the mail. <laughs> yeah, Here, I'm gonna link all the websites to these albums down below. Uh, yeah, like. You know, I try to leave off Lonely Ghost stuff, obviously, because I don't think that's like really what the conversation's supposed to be. So oh, I try because no. it makes it weird. But like, obviously, you know, I think the stuff that we're putting out is like unique and, and awesome and fun and like interesting. And it's just like the people who are so like putting this stuff out are so talented. Like everybody on this label is so fucking talented. You know, I'm yeah, just like. It makes sense that we should do a year in review type of type of thing, you know. Yeah. And yeah. we're probably going to do another mixtape uh, in the fall as well, or fall. It'll be like in November. Once we have that Famish album out, we'll probably do like a, 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 a autumn mixtape for um, Lonely Ghost like we did in the spring. So yeah. we'll have new stuff on there. Because like Nano will be on that one, you know, we didn't even, Nano wasn't even out yet when we did the last one. 
which that album is still those, under, in my opinion it's so good those indiana boys all right they got it they they, they got, got it going on i don't know if like their parents gave them special food or <laughs> like, water or something good in there but like they got it like they, they don't need any help with anything I mean, and like Ghost Fan Club, that's another band everybody should go check out. Like, yeah, definitely, that's a good song they have in the split. You know, cool. actually, they they added yeah. an instrumental. Uh, it. Yeah, and Funeral Homes is always top tier in my opinion. I, I will probably almost guaranteed have new music coming out next year. You know, like I just feel like we have a lot of cool shit going on. If people don't fuck with Lonely Ghost, I feel like they absolutely are missing out. And it's got to be something you're gonna like with all of it. You know, Holy Kerouac is about to be have a great year next year. We're finally getting. Yeah. This- Serious music out versus an EP, and uh, you know, plus discussing the song, plus they're working on new stuff that I've heard. So, plus you know, we have one unannounced signee still who's making some some banger fucking music. On top of you know, we're gonna have new you and discuss the song and all that. So, cool shit, man. Like honestly, like next year's gonna be cool. Oh yeah, and uh, that was a good interview you guys did with uh, with uh, Alternative. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that was, uh, I was really honored to be asked to do that, to be honest with you. That was cool. I really appreciated it, that they were willing to talk to us because, you know, I don't know, I guess sometimes it's hard for me to see things as being interesting to other people. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, it's, I, to, I, don't, I, I think it's impossible for it to be seen otherwise, because ever since Halloween 2, we've been on, you know what I mean? You know, yeah. like Lavender House pretty much kicked off lonely ghost 2.0 which is yet to stop you know like yeah it's like you know and really if you think about it in the context of things like lonely ghost had really only existed a year at that point yeah Uh, and really you know we had just been that first year was really just us trying to figure out how to even make music or anything like it was super rudimentary it was barely you know other than the fact that we technically existed like we weren't really a label yet and like you know it took that first year figuring it out like lavender house maybe winnebago vacation uh camp somewhere was like one of our first like proper albums really you know short stories about ghosts was kind of my first proper thing camp somewhere and lavender house were like the first like really fully realized albums we did and then you put out 2.0 like a month later oh yeah i mean two yeah like lavender house lavender house 2.0 um, you changed. I mean, that all came out bam, bam, bam. You know, like. Oh no, 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 no! Something about this needs to change. Was our was the first year record? That was the first year record. Was it? Yeah, that Dude, came out after that, that came out. Proper record then, for sure. That was our first proper album. Yeah, because that, uh, that came out the same month as like the Cure, the Cure. Uh, That's right. Holy um, shit! That album is that was our first proper release. But we and then short stories came out after that. Then Winnebago. Then Funeral Homes. Yeah, yeah, but like back to back, we had Lavender House, Phantom, and um, uh, the Holy Caroline EP, and then Home Movies. Like, it like, feels like that was 2019, but that was 2020. Oh my god! Well, like, Lav- yeah. like yeah, like yeah, Phantom, Home Movies, and uh, God, man, why am I why am I blinking? Why am I blinking on a Holy Caroline record? Oh, closer now more than ever. Yeah, closer now more than ever. Like, let's put out Shag Lab. I mean, we had a lot of cool stuff last year, too. I haven't acknowledged Shag Lab in a while, so you have to forgive me on that one. <laughs> Shag Lab, Slim Fit. We put out uh, Holy Kerouac. Um, um, Icarus. Icarus was also Icarus. that year. Icarus. You know. I mean, strong. And Halloween 3 was a fucking banger. <laughs> that, was, that was a banger. So, you know, we had a good year last year, too. But this year has been, I think we've really surpassed ourselves this year. And I think next year is about to kick its ass again this year. So that's really what I've been going for is just try to have every year we're doing or putting out cooler shit. And uh, I think we've, if nothing else, I think we've lived up to that. I personally feel like we've lived up to that. So, you know, well, it's going to be like what, four months until uh, the year we have a year anniversary of things, of the, things are made out of things. Like, Oh my like, God. It's like a season away, buddy. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. Yeah, it came out in February, did it not? Yeah. Oh, fuck, it sure did. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, and like uh, next year we already have like what I think eleven releases that we know of, so there's really not much real estate left for people. Um, but you know, we're gonna have a lot of. We're probably gonna do another comp. 
and uh, we're gonna have a lot of a lot of really great albums coming out next year so yeah oh and uh yeah as of last august uh home movies was a year old you know yeah, so about it but honestly so i went back and listened to that album like a month ago and it's better than i think well maybe not better but like i remembered it very negatively and I, when i listened to it i was like yeah this wasn't that bad there was definitely some good songs on it so you know that was a fun album it was kind of the first real super destroyer album in my opinion because it's like when i figured out kind of what i wanted this project to be and sound like and how i could you know do what i wanted to do like as a as a, as a creator you know so like that was kind of like when i figured that out and that's that album was really fun to make if nothing no shade nakamura is so fucking good man like I still have a remix of of a song on that record. I believe, yeah, I do still do have one sitting around. So, wait, where is it? I've never heard it. Uh, or did I do that off of uh, off of things I made? I think no, no, it was definitely, it was definitely, uh, it was definitely home home, home movies. Yeah, it's still, it's still insane to think that Halloween three and three point X is still like less than a year old. You know, like oh, damn. Yeah, I mean, when you do shit like this, like time passes by slow. You know what I mean? Like there's so much shit, dude. I mean, like you know. For me, I work on every release. So that's the other thing is like, I'm, this is like 10, 12 album cycles later already. Yeah. You know? like, like, holy fuck, that feels like a year ago, a decade ago, like five years ago. I mean, like, you know, it's like the fact that Lonely Ghost is only three years old feels preposterous because that means three years ago at this time, we announced that we existed. We had like, 20 Twitter followers or some shit. And that was like basically what our label was. And like, you know, now we have all these moving parts and like, we're still small, but like, you know, like I feel like we have all the pieces in place that we need. And like, it's a lot different to do this now than it was then. And I don't know. Yeah. It's kind of crazy to think like, this is where we're at. So, Hey, let's open year four. I'm like, Oh my God, that last year, like wow i can't even believe that was only a year ago it feels like it was 10 because <laughs> that means year, year four i'm starting some beef with people that's what i'm doing no you gotta wait till you're gonna, gonna come up with a meek mill diss track or some shit i don't know <laughs> yeah, you're five. You're, yeah okay okay yeah, <laughs> we can start talking shit it depends on who you beef with <laughs> beef with people way bigger than us so that you know it gives us attention oh yeah 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 i'll just bust the rhymes or something yeah <laughs> Yeah, you got to get somebody with a real fragile eagle who you know will respond. So, like, uh, Meek Mill might actually be a good choice. <laughs> Drake. Yeah, oh, man. Uh, diss Drake. <laughs> somebody like that. Like Kanye. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't diss Drake. It was born in October. Even though I don't like Drake like that, I can't. I can't. Diss Kanye. Kanye will respond because Kanye's a baby. <laughs> Probably less of a man than Drake's son. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, where can people find you? Uh, you know, all the places, uh, Twitter and Instagram at super destroyed. Uh, you know, go, you can listen to me on Spotify and all the, the places. Uh, our website is lonelyghostrecords.com. You can find all of our releases there. You can find our merch there. You can find all of our artists there. You can find any press you about them there. You know, you can find a lot of stuff. So our website's the main hub. Um, we also yeah, have band- it's the best place to buy our music, to be honest, is uh, LonelyGhostRecords.com. Yeah, so go check out our stuff. And, uh, you know, we're also on Bandcamp. You can find us. We're Lonely Ghost Rex on Bandcamp. And, uh, again, super destroyed on everything else. Um, and I'm also, I also do run the Lonely Ghost uh, Twitter account, so that's at Lonely Ghost Rex. And Shane does the Instagram, which is also, I believe, at Lonely Ghost Rex. So, you know, we're around. Feel free to DM me if you have a question about some shit, and I'll usually respond. Yeah, pitch all your records to uh, Super Destroyed. Yeah, pitch, 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 pitch them all. Actually, don't yeah. pitch them to my Twitter, please, God. <laughs> Info at LonelyGhostRecords.com. Oh, yeah. Please. And, and don't ask me about some out of out of run tapes either. So, well, I no, do. Don't, the- no, don't, don't, don't ever, don't ever, don't ever ask me about out of stock merchandise ever. <laughs> Yeah, no. don't listen. The inventory is the inventory, so like I don't have it. I'll have it. It's gone. I don't know. Yeah. Like, I'm not, you know, bought that I shit. Tapes myself. Let me be perfectly honest with you. I make it. I dub every fucking tape from Lonely Ghost Records has been dubbed with these hands, and I'm only gonna make so many. So you know, until we we're making like over a hundred at a at a run, uh, 
I'm sorry if they're sold out. If there's enough demand, we'll redo a run. But if there's like only one person asking, you're gonna have to go on Discogs or something and find yeah. it. Cause, you know, it's just only so many tapes I can make. So. Oh, and don't ask label employees or artists for their personal stashes either. That's also very annoying. It's also yeah. a very annoying thing. I stopped posting pictures of my tapes because of that. <laughs> like, boundaries, respect people's boundaries. And uh, again, like what we have is what we have. Um, but, you know, like, for example, like we'll probably do another run of a few of our tapes based on the fact that it seems like people want them. Like there could be a few that we bring back, but, you know, we're not going to make 50 tapes to sell 26. That doesn't really make sense. I don't so, know about your fans, but mine are broke. So don't, you know. I, mine are broke. Mine don't. <laughs> They have better things to spend money on than yeah. Sushi. They but, gotta uh, get a yeah. Gas. but yeah, so uh thanks for having me on. And uh this is a good this is a good talk. I, I I'm glad I got to talk about this album and uh you know, yeah. Uh this is Leave Nelson B, uh artist and host. Uh listen to such joy. It is a damn good super show.